When Erasure started, it was originally intended that Andy should just sing my songs. So actually, he was employed by me, really, just to sing the songs. But um, as the relationship developed, you know, um, Andy started contributing towards the songs. And now we're kind of a 50-50 team, you know. There wasn't really, it wasn't really like a pulling of the strings kind of situation, you know. We, do, we really didn't know how we were going to get on at first, you know, we'd only just met, you know, an audition, so we had no idea how the thing would develop. Um, but it took a while for us to get to know each other and uh, understand each other. The main difference between Yazoo and Erasure is the fact that, that the um, partners get on a lot better. You know, in uh, Yazoo there was a lot of tension and there were kind of many conflicts of interests and differences of opinion. Uh, whereas with Andy, I found someone that I can relate to much easier, and you know we we share s the same kind of views about things and about music, so it's a much more workable relationship. There was just a little too much tension with you, so. When Erasure had their first album out, we spent about a year recording it, and messing about really, and then um, we didn't sell any singles, didn't have any um, kind of top 40 success, so um, we decided to start t to play live as much as we could. So we were playing universities mainly to uh, bar staff or to maybe a couple of other people, you know. And although it was um, kind of a bit disheartening, we were still so enthusiastic about what we were doing, you know, it made us more determined, I think, and kind of ultimately, I think it's kind of pulled myself and Andy closer together, you know, because we had to kind of struggle a bit, you know, and we had to travel in back to transit vans and stuff, you know, and I think it's made us more, uh, made us accept the situation as it is now far easier, you know. We're not like up in the clouds somewhere. in the studio, as I say, there's just two of us. There's, I do all the music, Andy does all the singing. And um, for us, it's a, well, for me, I mean, I like that way because it, there's more satisfaction involved, you know. I don't have to say it the drum, well, I don't like that feel there. I don't like that chord there, you know. I can just change it myself if I don't like it. And at the end of the day, you know, you hear your record and it's just you on it. And it's really satisfying. You haven't got to deal with other people's egos. I can't sing and Andy can't play the computer, so. I don't see myself as a musician at all. I mean, uh, I started off when I was 11 playing violin, which was atrocious. And then I started playing guitar, which got no better. And then I went on to keyboards. And then I discovered sequences, which actually play keyboards for you. And uh, no, I don't, I don't, you know, I've no, I can't do all this on the keyboard at 100 miles an hour. But I can do this on a computer much quicker.
for Lee Nobbs is a true image. I, that's all I do, actually. It's like a bigger uh, toy shop in the studio, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, you know, we use lots of old, kind of different types of equipment. You know, with lots of big knobs and faders on, and I can spend all day just just messing about. <laughs> when a live situation, it's um, I think Andy kind of comes to the uh, forefront. You know, because he's a a real performer, and he's prepared to lump to a jump jump about and leap about, you know, and do all sorts of extraordinary things to keep the crowd entertained. Whereas I'm content to just stand at the back and like you say, to build a few knobs. N not so many knobs as in the studio. <laughs> but, um, I mean, live playing live is important to us because, uh, well, it's just a, it's a part of the job. It's another part of the job, you know. It's for a start, it's a big ego trip, you know, and uh, it's it, it's really um, testing a different kind of side of the technology because you have to. To, uh, you've got certain limitations when you start programming for life. But um, it's an exciting thing to do, you know, because the whole thing, we, we get involved in the whole concept of the show. You know, we'll plan the beginning from, from the choreography to the lights to the set and everything. Four years of touring with the venues have gotten bigger and bigger, especially in the UK. But we're still playing clubs in Switzerland and uh, in Holland or places like this, you know, because we don't sell that many records. It's um, it, it's a different thing, really. It's a different kind of feeling when you play a big arena. Um, you know, the show has to be much more extravagant, I think. And, more of a kind of a theatre production, you know. Um, but this, we're going to tour again now for this, uh, the new album chorus, and that will we'll tour again in the next summer. But I think what we're going to try and do is play small theatres this time round in the UK at least. And um, instead of doing one night or two nights at places like Dawkins Arena, we'll do two weeks at the Hammersmith Odeon or something like this, you know, just for a different feeling, because. Uh, Obviously, when you play big venues, you lose the intimacy. And Andy, you know, really communicates with the audience, I think. And uh, in a big arena, that's lost. I can't believe what is happening to me. My head is spinning. The clouds and the trees are encapsulating me. Are snobby. I think that just comes with the job. I don't, I don't, you know, it's uh, it's very hard sometimes not to be kind of snobby because you always think that your music is better than somebody else's. You know, um, I don't know. I used to be kind of impressed by people that were ultra cool. I suppose you know when I was younger, but um, not anymore. I, I, it just comes. I think as you get older, you know, you start to realise well, you know, life's too short. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. I don't think with. Um, Doing pop TV shows and um, you know pop interviews really. I think uh, that's what our music, that's where our music comes from. It's like um, when I see interviews with people and they say, you know, that their music is from the street and uh, you know from uh, 
it's got a certain, and that gives it, therefore it gives it credibility. I know that those people would never mix with anybody in the street. You know, and there's certain people, or if they didn't look the right part, and they, they wouldn't go into those clubs, you know, never hear their music, so. You know, there's so much, there's a lot of bullshit. People are too hip for their own good sometimes. Certain things, certain uh, kind of sales gimmicks that they used that, are, that we don't like at all. You know, the, the, it's, for instance, uh, it's not video so much actually, more uh, 12 inches and special 12 inches and extra releases. It's always a con, I think, because um, you make one record and that's, the, that's, the, that's it, that's your product and it's really good, you really like it. And then you have to make seven other remixes because everybody else is making seven remixes of their songs, you know. And each, each one has the same catalogue number, so it counts towards the sales. That's something that's a bit of a cheek. But it is kind of changing now, because uh, in the UK, for instance, they're uh, limiting the amount of formats that you can release, which I think is quite good. It's a shame that, I mean, when I, when 12 inches kind of started happening, you know, 10 years ago, they were made purely for DJs, and they were, and, they weren't necessarily even extensions of the song. They were just louder, deeper cuts in the vinyl. That's, that's, that was their purpose. And I think it would be nice now if people made 12 inches, not because it was a sales thing, but because artistically the, they felt the song deserved a 12 inch. <laughs> videos it's always a pain in the arse actually because um, neither of us like doing them particularly. Um, it's very hard I think when there's just two of you to make the video interesting and uh, you, the, you do them purely as a sales prop and that's it. You know, there's nothing particularly artistic in them I don't think and uh, they're always too expensive, you know, ridiculous, ridiculous money. You know you, you, you spend your budget for videos, for making free videos, is the same as making as the budget for making an album for five months. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So, but it's something you have to come to terms with because you can't necessarily play in all the territories. You know, you can't necessarily go to Yugoslavia, so we can do send you a video. It's just, but it is just purely sales. Um, neither of us are budding art, um, actors. I want to be in films. You know, we make music.
I try not to be a pop, I try not to be a pop star, you know. I don't own a car, and I haven't got a big mansion anywhere. I live in a flat in Amsterdam. Um, I don't like to go to clubs. I, I, you know, the worst thing is going to a club and uh, and presenting the big I am, you know, in order to get in for free. You know, I, I can't stand that. I'd sort of get turned away. Well, in different territories, we're perceived as a different sort of music, you know. In England, I think we just, I think people see us as a family band, you know. And when we play concerts here, then um, we have all sorts of people come along of different ages. Whereas if we get, go to some, say, Sweden, the audiences are very much younger and we're more of a teeny type band, you know. In America, they see us as an alternative band. You know, it's very weird and wonderful. I suppose it's just to do with the me different mentalities, you know. We go recording of the album, we wanted to get a different flavour um, and all the albums that we'd recorded previously, we'd recorded in the UK. So um, we went to see a studio in Toulouse in France and um, we were told by the owners there that it would be hot in the winter and in fact it was freezing cold, you know. So uh, we moved out of Toulouse and then to Hamburg, um, not for the um, technical, particularly for the technical uh, and the qualifications of the studio because, I mean, the studio was really good technically, but as you, you know, there's, there's good studios everywhere. But uh, also for the vibe of the town, you know, because it's a great place to go out at night. There's lots of clubs and bars. Um, you know, just to get a different atmosphere, really. Different influences. Our spontaneity, I think, comes in the writing because it's, you know, it's dependent on how we're feeling how much we drunk the night before, all these kind of things, you know. But in the studio, it's very calculated. You know, it's worked out, and uh, the sounds are carefully crafted. There's no feeling of trying to get a live feel in the studio, you know. I mean, the album we've just recorded is probably the most unlive record you can imagine, hopefully.
30 Sekunden.